Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Welcome back to another wonderful Wednesday. That's the catchphrase. Oh, man. So I'm with Mitch, and I just realized uh, it's not going to say your name correctly. It's still going to say Jason (laughs) from last week. We've been talking the entire time, so this is not Jason. This is Mitch. That's my bad. Sorry. I I could not be Jason. (laughs) You could be Jason for tonight. What a story he has, though. That wasn't If you guys didn't watch that one, go back and watch it. Yeah, it was was good. I I enjoyed sitting down with him and talking. Um, (laughs) I I can't believe I dropped that. We got stuck talking, so whatever. Um, Yeah, so let us know. (laughs) Oh, that tickles me. Let us know where you're watching us from. We're here to discuss Sunday's uh, message, Woe to Them, which was part four of uh, Contend. And uh, just let us know where you're watching from. Drop drop your favorite quote or something memorable in the chat while we get going. I'll hit the... um, announcements real quick and these are all on our website familychurch.social we have the next dining with dignity is november 7th that's tomorrow if you're watching this live is at uh, 5 30 that's downtown the next women's fellowship night is november 14th uh, 6 30 and then we have the fire youth friendsgiving november 17th Uh, at 6 p.m., and then our annual Friendsgiving potluck. I'm excited for that. It's always good to have food. And uh, that's November 23rd at 4 p.m. We have our next blood drive on December 1st on a Sunday morning, which those have have been really good so far. Um, They've said that... (laughs) I'm still tickled. I forgot to change your name. Uh, Oh, yep, there it is. Yeah, there it is. That's funny. So, Jason, 2.0. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but no, the blood drive thing, they, they, apparently they like coming here, and they said it's a good turnout every time. Um, but I'm, in, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm looking forward to you know everything we've got going on, and then it's crazy that it's already the end of the year. But, uh, yeah. man, I am... It's moving fast. I'm, I'm excited now. Now what's going to happen? With given just everything and the 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 shift in the atmosphere, I'm excited to see where God's about to take us. I think I think it's it's really about the the whole revival. Yeah, thing about to really I, take I off. think you're right. And just you got to take everything with a grain of salt that you see on social media. But what I do have purview to on social media, you see more and more clips of people singing worship songs yeah. gathering you saw that you know from yesterday but even leading up to the election and just this whole year in general you've seen a, a shift especially in the younger culture our age down um, you're starting to see more and more of these sort of pop-up revivals and pop-up like testimony nights of young kids and colleges and wasn't you know, there one in the country uh close isn't there one in florida that just happened <sighs> there might have been i don't know if I've i mean there's been a bunch i saw i saw it on facebook there's, there's definitely a shift and that was one of my big prayers i was up till probably three last night um praying not only for the election but really just for the nation and for the continuation of what we're seeing and not yeah. to let it die down as so many people do in human nature. It's like, everything's good now, and you kind of take your foot off the gas, but now's the time to No, we got to keep the foot on the gas. Press in and uh, continue to go, so. I think uh, not even, obviously with the with the country, but not to get <laughs> political, right. but just even from this, the state of the church, um, just that whole that whole tendency of like taking taking your foot off the gas, things get good, and then we start to mm-hmm. start to coast into comfortability, and you get to that point where you know things are good and they're gelling and it's going mm-hmm. good, and then all right, well you know we don't got to try as hard. Well, that's what happens, and then we get yep. back to where we were before. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'll just speak it in, in, into uh, to existence. I I think we're about to see the next great awakening. Um, which will also simultaneously, I think, be the last great awakening. Right. Uh, with everything that's going on in the world and, and all the stuff that's happening, um, I, you know, and we've talked about it before, I, I think this is the last days. 
And, oh man, I, I read something earlier on that and it was so good. And I don't remember where I put it. I've got it highlighted somewhere. It'll be in a sermon, good. but it was, I read it and I'm like, oh yes. Yeah, we're, we're definitely getting close and yeah, they're, they've got to press in, press in more. Oh, that's what it was. Continue on. It was something about, I have to read it again so I don't mess it up, but some, something about the last days, um, Oh man, I'm going to botch it. There was something about, because you remember when Jesus first ascended Mm -hmm. and then people thought, you know, oh, he's coming back in like two weeks, so we're not going to do anything anymore. And then now we're, we had the the arrival of his first coming and now we have the, the, the waiting period in between the second coming. That's the last days. I can't remember. I have to watch it because... I messing it up. It, it was so good when I read it, or it might have just been because it was four in the morning, and that, I'm like, that whole the statement right there though you made was has been on my head. So you've seen that a lot too, where it's like, oh, Jesus came back. We don't have to do anything. Yeah, and you kind of saw a lot of that sentiment. Not to distract too much from the actual message, but there was a lot of people like, well, God's in control. Why do I need to pray about it? Why do I need to vote? Why do I need to do anything? And that's such a it's such a cancerous mindset that yeah. infects, that goes beyond just oh, praying about the election. That goes on to anything where people are like, well, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it anyways. But he doesn't call us to have that mindset. He no. calls us to pray. He wants that relationship. And honestly, that mindset comes from a place of God being your waiter. And you're Ooh. just, <laughs> you're talking to him like you're ordering at a restaurant. Yeah. And so your thought is, well, he's not going to do it anyway. Well, what are you asking for? It's not always about asking. You know, yeah. He's not a vending machine that you go to just to ask from. He's supposed to have a relationship. And so if you have a wife or you're in a relationship and you only go to that person and say, hey, can I go out with the guys? Hey, can I do this? Hey, and eventually you're always getting no's or maybe's or waits. You know, well, I'm not going to ask her. It's going to be no. But that's not the point of that relationship is just to ask for things. The point of that relationship is to converse and yeah. to talk and to be present with each other. And so I say, if you're, if you're sitting there thinking prayer is hopeless or there's no point, then I would urge you to start recording yourself praying and listen to it back and see what you sound like and tell me you don't sound like you're ordering something at a restaurant and that you're, you're taking it beyond what it's supposed to be. That's why I love, um, I always want to say Matthew 10, but it's Matthew 6. 10 is what I'm always thinking, but the Lord's prayer mm-hmm. and how he models it for us. And I think the big thing in churches is, uh, you know, a lot of people think that's, that's the prayer. Like just say that verbatim and it's all right. good. And it's like, man, when you, when you break it down and you look at it and he says, pray like this the template, and then it breaks it down. And it's, yeah, it's the template where it's, you're giving God his reverence up front. Like, uh, Philip Anthony Mitchell had a really good teaching on it, and he was talking about, um, he was like, the way he, he said it was kind of like praying with your kids. He's like, eventually you got to grow up from the, you know, the now I lay right. me down to sleep thing. And he, was, he said there was, a, there was one time where he had talked with his daughter about it, and then she went to, they were in like a group, and she went to pray. And he said it took a minute, and then she started praying, and then... Uh, you know, it was like the kids kind of prayer thing. And then she, he stopped her and he's like, hold on. He's like, take a minute. He's like, take however much time you need. He said, think about who you're praying to, who you're talking to, put your head, your mindset on, on who God is. And he said, it was like several minutes went by in just silence. Everybody's just sitting there. And then he said, as soon as she opened her mouth, it was like the whole wall, everything just Mm -hmm. came down. And it was like, this just epic prayer. And I think that's like the big thing is we like that. We go to God like a like the genie from Aladdin, you know, mm-hmm. rubbing the lamp and hey, pop up and I need this, I need this, I need this, see it, you know, next Tuesday mm-hmm. when we <laughs> when we, you know, want to pray again sporadically. But it's like when you take that time to put your mind on where you're going uh, and who you're talking to and then putting his will before yours. I think that's where a lot of people get their weights or their nose and then they assume that's just an unanswered prayer. It was like, no, you, you always get an answer. Right. It's either a yes, a no, or a wait. And I think, you know, like that, if we don't hear a yes, we're immediately, oh, this doesn't work. Right. I tried that Jesus, I tried the prayer thing, it doesn't work, you know, this and that and all the other stuff. And it's just like, man, it, I think that's the greatest tool right there is record yourself mm-hmm. and see. I mean, obviously uh, that requires you to open your mouth and right. not just pray in your head. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a really valuable tool. Uh, 
Luckily, mine are always, not always, but most of the time recorded, and I can just, you know, get to listen back to myself yelling at everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, tonight, we hopefully will, nice, we uh, hopefully will break down the message, woe to them, uh, for any of you who remember, it was Jude 11 through 13. I'm a, let's go off of your notes because we already know my notes because <laughs> I know the message. So let's go off of what you got and let's, let's just dive in. Well, I'm going to address what I think everyone took away. One of their favorite things that you said was God won't let a rival stop a revival. When did that come to you? Dude, I don't, I don't remember. I was, I was writing. Oh, what was it? Let's see if I can find it because I have it, I have it uh, highlighted in red. So what was it? It was, uh, oh, so it was the whole thing with, with Korah and how they were rebelling against Moses. Mm-hmm. You know, why are you in charge? We should be the one in charge kind of thing. And there's so much of that in many churches where people just think uh, it's like an easy job. And while this is my job, I don't really view it as like a job. It's right. obviously a calling. Either you're called right. or you're not. And it's very apparent I would say, um, and I don't mean this like arrogantly because I, I don't mean it about myself, but you can always tell when someone's just not called to be a pastor. Yeah. Well, maybe not always because obviously there are the false prophets, which, you yeah. know, they're, they're clever and they're wolves in sheep's clothing. So I guess not always, but you can see them if you look at their fruit. Um, but yeah, I don't, that was just, I was going through and I was writing about, it's, it's underneath when I wrote it down, it's underneath when I was talking about how the whole family's got wiped out and everything. Mm. And then that just came to me clearly from the Holy Spirit. And it was just like, he's not, because, you know, Moses was like, hey, yeah. everybody come here, get away from him. If it happens this way, it's, you know, I was wrong. If it happens this way, it was God. Yeah. And immediately, I think it's, that's like the most, just swallowed one up. of the most gangster things God did is just immediately right after he started or stopped talking, it's exactly how he said it was going to happen and just swallowed him up. I mean, that's just like, yeah. That but is, then there's also the, the down depressing side of it's the, well, that's the women part and of, That's children. part of the, I mean, that's part of going back to Jude and his letter, the woe, woe unto them. Yeah. Woe is not only, you know, an, an urgency and a warning, there's also a sense of like sadness in there. Yeah. Like there's a Grief sense of like, anguish. They're losing their opportunity to, of you know, their opportunity of repentance and their opportunity of reconciliation. Like woe unto you, um, and it's not only a warning, but it is a sense of like that's a tremendous kind of. It loss. should be, and it's a horrible, horrible feeling to yeah. know that that's happening. But I think it should be a wake up call. Or should have been. Mm-hmm. It should be to anyone still living, but obviously to like them, uh, to Jesus or to the Pharisees when Jesus was telling them like that should, it's probably how he meant it. It was just, it's a warning. It's a warning. Like mm-hmm. this is a, a word of grief and anguish, but it's also a word of judgment. It's like, y'all, and that's <laughs> you're why, in the wrong. Well, that's why Jude goes on to follow it up with yeah. everything from Cain to Balaam to, to Korah. And it was interesting too. And pointing out not only the, the nouns and the adjectives of what that walked you through and kind of that progression of, of sin and how it works in your life and how sin doesn't just affect you, sin affects the people that you come in contact with, but it starts with you and then it kind of seeps out. And I think I mentioned this in my night of the testimony, Satan doesn't want just the one ear of corn. He wants the entire field. And so he's going to put something and plant something into your life or into other people's lives that aren't going to necessarily manifest immediately. Just like the fruit when somebody gets saved doesn't bear fruit the next day. It takes time. A lot of times Satan's little seeds of sin they take time to manifest so that way more people can come in contact with it through you and he can bring down an entire field, an entire harvest instead of the single ear of corn. Yeah. And so it's it's important to see that progression of, you know, Cain and Abel, that was a, that was a singular thing. And then Balaam where, you know, he, he trades in that thing for the profit and for the gain and he brisks everybody else. And the order of that too, where technically it's Korah's first, Chapter-wise, yeah. but Korah's last in the mentions because that's the result yep. of everything. So yeah, I think it's that's why it's it, that's why I love just studying the Bible because you can, I mean, you can read it and it'll mean whatever, and then when you study it, you start getting to the meaning. But then when you go into that just 
deep dive rabbit hole like uh, you know, you click on like the little letters or whatever when you're on one of the Bible study apps and then it, it brings up all the other scripture, yep. like the cross references. And then you just start diving into those and then you look on those cross references and then you look at the strong concordance with the, the Hebrew or the Greek. And it's just when you start diving in and then you're like, whoa, yeah. there's so much. And then like that, just because we read that. And I mean, and I'll, I'll say it too, like just from American culture from western culture and then also being 2000 years after it was written give or take um we don't have that understanding mm-hmm. and for a lot of americans with their our i don't want to just say their our biblical illiteracy you read you know you read through jude and you read uh you know balaam and you know, i'm sure a lot of people know cain because yep. cain and abel but then you read balaam and you're like, well, who the heck is that? And then you read mm-hmm. Korah, and you're like, well, I don't know who these people are. And if you just problem, the tendency for people would just be read through that and like, oh, I don't really know what that means, or just it's whatever, it's a name to you. But then yeah. when you dive back in and you study, well, why was this brought up? And then you look at the nouns, and you look at the verbs because of the word choices, because it's all breathed out by the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and inspired. It's like, that's how you get those layers after layer after layer, where it's you can dive in this way, and then you see it means this, but it also means this, and then you just keep going down. It's, man, it's the more I do it, the yeah. more it's just like I, it's a I lot. just don't That's where, stop. and you've done a good job too. And you know, old pastors, and there's a lot of there's a lot of good Bible pastors that tell you this, and people just don't hear it. Which is get in the Word. They yeah. can't. Your your relationship with Jesus isn't through your pastor. It's a one on one, and you need to get in the Scriptures. And I don't remember who it was. It might have been Philip Anthony Mitchell who had a statement where people um, in America, especially American Christianity, is so full of sermons but not full of scripture. Yeah. And so you, you have all these snippets of sermons and these little, these little uh, puns and these nice little sayings and these little quips and these one-liners that are, that are fluffy and feel good or kind of smart and like, oh, profound, but there's no scripture. We're filled up on sermons without the scripture because the relationship is only through the person on stage and not the one-on-one relationship with Jesus um, that they should have. But it is very... It is very powerful once you get into the scriptures yeah. and you go into it. And uh, that was something that I, I started to look up when we went into Korok's I, I remember, well, Miriam and Aaron, they also went yeah. to Moses. That's where I started. Yeah. But there it's was like, like, there was no way so, to get that far. And I think that it. was cool too. Cause I, I went to that with, okay, Miriam and Aaron, they also went to Moses, but they didn't get swallowed up. Why? Why didn't they get swallowed up? And so I already had kind of a base, like, okay, I know it's a little bit different. Like, it's a familial thing and versus uh, a power leadership. But if you really look at the heart intent of, one, why they went to Moses in the first place or what they were doing, and then, two, the big one, which you see also in um, Samuel when you talk about... Um, uh, I think King Saul and David was playing the music of King Saul and he's being tormented... There was a lack of repentancy yeah. from Korah and his people. And ultimately, that's what it was. You, you had Miriam and Aaron that went to him and said, hey, why are you speaking for God? Who's, who basically, who put you here? Why do yeah. you think you're the one in power? Does God not only, not only speak through you, but also through us? And it was more of a pure, I want to say pure, well-intentioned curiosity of like, hey, we're part of your family. Why are you the only one that's being called and not us? And there's this honest question for it and God comes down and reveals himself and says no this is the prophet and uh, Miriam takes her punishment and stripped of leprosy and cast out and, and you know she serves her seven days they repent yeah. they come back and then you look at Korah when you actually look at the scripture Korah went around and gathered what 250 leaders so he, and it was the sole purpose oh. to the sole purpose to usurp God's authority. It, it did not go to Moses with an honest heart of, hey, why are you sure you're the one? How do you know? Let's talk about this. It was a no. I'm going to go and find 250 of the most important people to you and to this mission that we're on, and we're going to overthrow you, so to speak. Um, and so you look at that heart attitude and the fact that there was no repentance there, there was no turning away. And then you get swallowed up by the earth. So, so <laughs> that I just, God just put it in my head. Um, I brought it up in Mark. But when 
Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him uh, if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, and myself included, we read that, we see little ones, and we think, okay, he's talking about kids. If you cause a kid to sin, it's better for you to be dead. But in mm-hmm. its context, since we're all children of God, he's actually mm-hmm. saying whoever causes another brother or sister in Christ to sin, it's better for them to be dead. So I think a lot of that you can go from there and look back at um, Aaron and Miriam where, you know, there was only the two of them. Mm-hmm. And since it's the, the two, but they're married, so they're technically joined as one. I mean, now we're getting like super deep, but they're technically <laughs> joined as one. And then they do that, but they're grieved and they're immediately repentant over it. But this, the they still have to deal with the consequences of the they sin, still deal with the consequences. which is like uh, David and Bathsheba. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they do what they did. They commit adultery, murders deal the, the husband, and then they have to deal with the consequences of that. But then I, I what's beautiful to me is that um, David had the prophecy about Solomon building the temple before Solomon was there, and Solomon is the baby from the sin. So it's like mm-hmm. God takes all of the... Takes all of it. Oh, man. There, yeah, there's so much it of there. And you look at... all of it. Everything, but then with that, like with Cora, because he went, and obviously that takes time, like mm-hmm. that, like it doesn't. It rebellion time. doesn't just pop up mm-hmm. out of nowhere, nope. especially with two hundred and fifty people. That's more than most churches in America, yep. and so clearly, you know, this dude's running around for a long time, and and something that we had texted about beforehand, which is. Not to like read something into the Bible, but obviously what? that's how the fall of Satan happened, where right. he was in heaven and. Right, you know, it was you know, I'm going to be better than God. I'm going to be, I'm going to be better than God, and then he slips in and gets all yeah. these angels to go down with him, and yeah. just like that, like the rebellion is. I, I think obviously that's why, that's why it's structured the way it is in Jude is to show you like, hey, this started as a hidden sin, like with mm-hmm. Cain, but you harden your heart against it and you chose to decide that well, God didn't mean what He said. So then it goes to Balaam and you, you abandon all that stuff to go after the prophet so you could just get gain, mm-hmm. and then you once you were fully abandoned to it, then you're just in full blown rebellion and ultimately that leads to judgment. That's the climax of the whole uh, section of that passage is just that you've got to see. The progression of sin, um, mm-hmm. and man, what a what a mess! And then to bring other people down with you, Brought like so many people down with them. And then you look, and you look back again at, at Aaron and Mary. Mary was set out for seven days, which again, talking about the biblical number, the numerology of the Bible, seven, yeah. which is the perfection, the completion. So, set out for seven days. Something that I found interesting in reading that too was part of that repentant heart is repenting is you know your confession, agreeing with God about who you are repenting um, to, to cut off or to turn away from where you're at. And then the other part of that also is the reconciliation. And the Bible tells us that God has reconciled all of us to him. In that story, you also have Miriam set out for seven days and it Bible doesn't waste words. It makes mention that they waited for her to come back and return to the camp before they go on. You think about the, the Christian church, how many people fall into a sin or or cause offense and, you know, we want to set them out or we kind of outcast them and we move on and they come back and it's like, oh, the church, it's like, I don't even exist anymore. They've gone on without me. I don't mean anything to them where the Bible tells us they they waited for Miriam to come back and then continued on. Um, So, but they went through that process of the full repentance and, and the reconciliation. And the other thing that they did which you, you talked about. They went to them to went to Moses together. And the Bible tells us you have a fault of brother. Go to that person, yeah. seek that person, talk to them. Cora didn't do that. Cora went to everybody else except to the person he had a problem with in leadership, Moses or God, either one of those two, neither one, just went to everybody else. So um, that's another thing to to keep in mind is in the American church, so many people they don't they don't go to the person that they have an offense with. It's no. easier to they talk go to find about somebody them to and to vent about talk somebody about else. And, and yeah, it's it's not the way it should be. The Bible paints pictures for us and, and lays templates, not only how to pray, but how do we confront these circumstances. And in that circumstance, we should go to somebody who, who has offended us or who we ha- might have an issue with and talk to them directly without... You know, going yeah. around and trying to bring that's down just the foundations of the building. The culture now in society, I mean, 
with 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 cell phones and the beauty of technology you can connect with anybody at any time but now we're so connected digitally that we don't know how to have a face to face conversation anymore and then the idea of some type of confrontation scares the majority of people so it's like well I've got a problem with this person but instead of me being an adult and just going and hashing it out because I would I would wager most of the time with these kinds of things, with like churches and, and sin and stuff, if, if you just went to the person and talked with them like you're mm-hmm. supposed to do, I think like probably, you know, nine, maybe not nine times out of ten, but I would wager well into the majority of the time it could be solved oh, yeah. and, and things could be patched up um, simply because, you know, sometimes things, things just get misheard, they get misunderstood, or if you're already... <laughs> The typical thing with people is if you've already kind of got an idea about someone in your head and you don't like this person, you're going to hear what you want to hear. And you're going to be able to twist things in order to fit your agenda because, you know, I've already made up my Mm -hmm. mind about this person. So, you know, that, and that's just, you get to that thing where that's like harboring that resentment and that bitterness and then letting it fester to where it gets to the point where (laughs) just hearing the person breathe sets you off and you just want to, you know, wring them out by the neck. And it's like, man, if the first time you felt that anger or that frustration rising up and you were just like, Hey, let me go talk to this person and see what's going on. It'd solve a lot of problems. Yeah. It'd solve a lot of problems. And even if you couldn't come to an agreement you could still have some type of reconciliation where it's like, hey, we're not seeing eye to eye. Maybe this is where we part ways, but but there hasn't we been, can there still hasn't be been a severed a trust of yeah. oh, they didn't talk to me. They talked to somebody else. Because yep. a lot of times that trust is the hardest thing to reconcile. Um, it's not typically the event. A lot of times the event can be okay, whatever. It's over. It's the fact of how you handled the situation, which is a character thing. And we all know it's a lot harder to change someone's character. Yeah. And that goes back to Cora as well, the character of Cora. You know, he, a lot of times he wanted the position of power. And a lot of times people want things from God or they want positions of power in the church or their job. And they're either not called to it or they're not doing what needs to be done to be prepared so God can't bless you. And it's not a, when the Bible, and the Bible talks about this a little bit where God can't do something or can't bless, but it's not an inability of God's part. It's a lack of proper positioning of where you are. You are yeah. not in a position where God can bless you because God is holy, God is righteous. If he were to bless you in this situation, what does that say to him? He cannot do that. You know, if my kid is throwing an absolute monstrosity in a store, I can't reward that with ice cream. What does that tell the kid, <laughs> yeah. right? So in a lot of situations, one, you might not be called. Two, you might be called, but you're ignoring the steps that you need to do to have the blessing or the calling fulfilled in your life. So he physically cannot reward you or give you what you're supposed to be doing because you're not putting yourself in a position to do it. You're not reading the Bible the way you're supposed to. You're not praying for people the way you're supposed to. You're not tithing the way you're supposed to. You're not humbling yourself the way you're supposed to. And you know, a lot of times we think we're humble, but you know, lower yourself and serve the person who hurt you. Yeah. Tell them I love you. Pray for them. Hug them. Go Go change the tire and That's do like that something. Thing. It's what Kelsey shared the other day with Judah, Jesus loving oh, yeah. Judas so well that none of them knew he even, was the one. Yep. Exactly. But even that, like, you can take that and apply that back to Balaam mm-hmm. to where God won't bless you while you're actively trying to curse someone. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, when you, you look at the story. And God told him, hey, you, you're not saying this. They're blessed. And as he gives the three things, uh, the three, um, how does the Bible say it? The oracles or whatever of them. They're all blessing. And he mentions he can't curse them. And then yep. he prophesies about Jesus. And then you can step back and it's, uh, it's, it's such a dangerous thing. But just reading between the lines, and I'm not trying to like eisegesis something. So right. just hear me out. But... He doesn't get blessed from doing that. Uh, there, I don't think there's any um, passage in there that when he does that, it says he gets blessed. Because mm-hmm. his heart, he still wanted to get the money from the other person. So the only way that he ends up getting his blessing is by t- 
twisting the word and then going to the enemy and telling them how to how to twist the Israelites right. into cursing themselves, and then that gets him his gain. But then we find out uh, Joshua somewhere he's at shoot. I don't remember what chapter it is. It's like ten or six. But Balaam's name is the last, um, I think, name that is mentioned of the people that died by the Israelite sword. So he had his temporary earthly gain for causing them to curse themselves. Right. But it cost him his life. So he ended up, because he cursed because he cursed God's people, he ended up bringing a curse on himself. Oh, that little snippet that Kelsey little, sent. Like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised she didn't put that one on there. Right. But it's a, it is a character thing. And here's the thing that has been said to me a lot. A lot of times we get blessings. Like you said, not everything good is from God. God, we're sometimes we're in a position where God can't bless us because we're not where he needs us to be. And yet we're getting blessings and you have to really take a true, honest look at your life. Say, man, things are going great, but I, I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Where is this coming from? Because quite frankly, the devil knows your price. Oh yeah. The devil knows your price. And you know, there's a story of a guy who, who had a unfortunate looking son, right? And he, he went to this beautiful girl and said, hey, will you marry my son? And she's like, no. He's like, what if I gave you a million dollars? She's like, absolutely, I would marry your son. <laughs> he goes, okay, well, I don't have a million dollars. How does like a hundred bucks sound? And she was appalled. What kind of girl do you think I am? And his <laughs> answer is, we know what kind of girl you are. We're just haggling over price. Oof. <laughs> so the devil operates the same way. Yeah, the devil no, knows the what kind way. of character you have. At this point, he's just haggling with you over price. How much do I need to give you or take you to get you to walk away from your calling or walk away from where you're supposed to be in God's positioning system and his GPS? That's why you need to And know now we're words. haggling. It's not, oh, the character. I know your character. We're haggling over price right now. You know? that's, that, so that's, <laughs> ow, <laughs> I'm going to end up stealing that on a sermon. I would, I, what pops into my head off of that is that's, that's why it's important to know your worth. Know the price that Jesus know paid your for you. Worth. Mm-hmm. But the devil, <laughs> the devil makes you forget your worth or not focus on your worth. That way you'll whore yourself out to sin, to be bought for a price, uh, to be, let's see, how do I want to put it? To be bought for his price. Mm-hmm. How much earthly gain can he give you versus how much eternal gain can you get when you've already been purchased for a price? But that's what he does. He tries to get you to forget that. Mm-hmm. We've all, the sin, the sin debt, this has got to be careful because somebody will clip it up. The sin debt for everyone has already been paid, mm-hmm. but you're, you're, you still owe your debt when you try to hold on to it yourself. Uh, and not trust in Jesus as your Savior and, you know, and follow him as your Lord and Savior. So you end up holding that sin debt yourself and you can't do anything with it. It's like the, the parable of the, what is it, like 10,000 tal- talents or yeah. something like that. And that was the equivalent of like 200,000 years worth of wages. Like Elon Musk wouldn't even pay that right. off. So, you know, it's the devil. He just, he gets you to forget your worth. That way you end up whoring yourself out to yep. sin and anything else that can, you know, and it's <laughs> for some people, yep. oh man, it's rough, but for some people we're cheaper than others. Yep. And he knows it doesn't take well, much to get you off lie. the lie. When you hold track. on to that, when you hold on to that, the lie you're actually believing is God's blood wasn't enough. You look yeah. at God and tell him his blood wasn't enough. I'm not going to do it. That's what I, I like and to say to is. the people that get upset over like tattoos. So you're going to tell me that ink is, is, <laughs> is more than the right. blood of Jesus. Like, come on. I don't know. I get it. So that's that's a big thing to to think about as a character, and and you said it too earlier. Kind of jumping back off topics, I saw a comment here about um, you know you kind of find what you're looking for. That's human nature as well. It's part yeah. of the character of a person is we will always find what we're looking for. I think it was Tony Robbins that did um, kind of an experiment on one of his talks, and it's so true of human nature is that I want everyone to shut your eyes. Everyone open your eyes, look around the room. You got like 10 seconds, find everything you can that's red. All right, shut your eyes. Raise your hand if you saw anything red. Everyone raise their hand. Raise your hand if you saw anything brown or green or whatever it was. Nobody raised their hand. Said, so now how many of you people saw something that was kind of pink or kind of whatever and you just called it red because you didn't want to be left out? <laughs> Almost everybody raised your head. Shut your eyes, look for brown, look for brown. How many people saw brown? 
how many people saw something that's like brown and called it brown? It's because the point is, when you're told or you're looking for something, you're going to find it. If you're looking for a fence, you're going to find it. If you're Think about looking, it like shopping for a car. This, the minute you start looking for a specific it. car and everywhere. color, everywhere. And you've never everywhere. seen it before. <laughs> Every so single time. There's a, there's a lot to be said for that in the character and, and starting to have a very honest look at who we are individually of who am I? I'm a sinner, but what, what do I do? Well, how, how does the devil get me? Understanding your weaknesses. As a baseball player, I had to understand some of my weaknesses, what pitches I wasn't good at hitting, how can I be better at those? It's no different in the spiritual. How can the devil get me? What am I weak in? Am I an alcoholic? Do I have a pornography addiction? Do I have a lust problem? Do I have a lying problem? A stealing? What, what triggers me? And really being honest with ourselves and then starting to set up some of those those stanchions to protect us and those guardrails to keep us going keep us going straight and steady. I heard a good sermon one time called "Strengthen Your Strengths" because we always focus mm-hmm. with our weaknesses. You know how can how can I get better at my weakness? Which is you know like that. Like yep. it's important to know your weakness that way you know what you're better at. Right. And then the tendency for uh, you think like the gym. So like. The tendency for the gym is, yeah. you know, like, oh, so, okay, so, by, you know, I got small legs or something. My mm-hmm. t- so now that's my weakness. I'm going to go hit that harder. But it's like for a lot of the stuff in life, if we would quit focusing so much on our weaknesses to the point that we're just trying to break through them yep. and realize, okay, like this is an area I struggle in, but I'm really good over here. Okay, so let's, God, help me work on, like, help me not struggle, yep. obviously, but don't let that be my focus. Let's okay. shift my focus to, God, what have you made me good at yeah. that I can get better in because clearly you made me good at that for a reason that could yep. be my purpose and we can strengthen God help me strengthen my strengths I'm gonna get better at what you made me good at while helping yeah. me not ignore but acknowledge whoo, my my weaknesses but not focus on them where they mm-hmm. you know my whole that's fruit it right is there. tied up in the focus that. that's it it's there's a fine line between recognition and rumination where you just ruminate on it all yeah. the time and when you do that you're you're just gonna go down 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 that's like again, insecurity that's all you're thinking about you're rewiring your brain you're not trusting in God you're not giving the anxiety up there's a difference between recognition and rumination So going back to my baseball analogy, I know what I'm weak at hitting. It wasn't, okay, I'm really bad at hitting this low and away change it pitch. Let me do that all the time. And when I go to the box, all I'm thinking about is all that that low and away change it pitch. No, I'm going to cut it off. The Bible says we need to cut our sin off. And he separated our sin as far as the east is from the west. There's significance in that too for those that don't know. If you head east, you will always head east. You will never go back west. If you head west, you will always head west. You will never go back east. If you go north long enough, eventually you'll go south. If you go south long enough, eventually you'll end up north. He's separated us from the east to the west. So that sin is gone. So we can recognize it. I recognize I'm bad at this pitch, so what do I do? I don't focus on trying to get better at hitting that pitch and worry about that at bat. I take that pitch away. I crowd the plate and play to my strengths. Okay, I'm really good at pulling and doing this. I'm not good at that away pitch. I'm going to stand two inches closer, and nothing will be an away pitch. If it is, it's a ball. I can let it go. So we cut that off. And don't even worry about it. Don't ruminate on it. Don't think on it. Let's change our approach to how we deal with that problem by focusing on our strengths and repositioning ourselves to be in a better position of success. That's like, man, that's oh, that's how the enemy gets you so often. Is he? You think anytime you get uh, like you know you get in a moment of insecurity or depression or something, as soon as you start getting in that that dark place, it's always the enemy makes you focus on, well, it's always gonna be this way. You're always gonna feel this mm-hmm. way. You're always gonna be alone. The minute it's something positive, yep. well, you know it's not gonna be this way for long. It's, it's, you know, mm-hmm. it's gonna turn right back around, that type of thing. And then like that, the tendency to just self-mutilate yourself into yep. misery because, you know, oh, why did I do this and all that and focusing on that. And it's like, man, we need to get back to realizing that Jesus faced all the same temptations that we faced. Mm-hmm. I, oh, I heard that and earlier confident. and it was like, God, 
before Jesus came down, he didn't have a physical body. He didn't have an earthly body, so he had no veins. So how's he going to be sacrificed? How's he going to pour his blood out for our mm. sins? So he had to become a human, and then that's why he gets exhausted when he's walking to places because he's human, so he gets tired. That's why he knows what it's like to feel tired. He knows what it's like to feel anxiety and anger. He knows what it's like to feel temptation and all that stuff, but he never gave into it, but he knows the feeling. But that's why when you get in your sin and you stumble, the enemy wants you to ruminate on it. Yep. And that's why <laughs> that's why when you look anybody. at that website at 3 o'clock in don't the morning and you person, immediately, yeah. immediately feel guilty and you're like, oh my gosh, why do I, always, I, keep, oh, and I keep struggling with this and I keep doing that. Why do I keep going back to these pills? Why do I keep going back to the bottle? The enemy wants you to get, wants to get you to ruminate on that mm-hmm. and just be filled with regret instead of focusing and running towards Jesus to where it's like, God, I'm still struggling with this. I hate this. Help yeah. me deal with this. Yeah, let's build on that for a second. So I always love, and, and my coaching philosophy, when I, when I coached guys, I was really big on, I'm going to have you do things. If I don't tell you why, don't do it or stop and ask me. And if I can't tell you why I'm having you do a certain drill, don't do it. Same with, I ever, <laughs> I told my pitchers, if anyone is, if you're ever on the mound and someone looks at you and is like, hey, throw strikes, I always said, step off, look at them and say, what do you think I'm trying to do, right? <laughs> Throwing, like, that's not the thing. Like, so when we say, stop sinning, right? Or why do I keep going back to the pills? Why do I keep it? It's important to look at, okay, how, how can I do that? Okay, how can I stop doing that, Jared? How can I stop going back to the pills? And the Bible tells us um, to gather ourselves together, find a community, forsake not the assembling of yourselves, even more so as the day comes. The closer we get to the rapture, the more we should be assembling and coming together as a family. And into the secular world, they did a study on rats and mice where they put mice into, um, into like a cage in isolation with like cocaine and drugs. And the mice within a certain amount of time went and basically did all the drugs, coked out, and were super depressed, gained weight until they eventually like killed themselves, like died. They put mice in the same cage with the same cocaine, but they gave them tools, they gave them like wheels, and they gave them other mice. Not a single mice touched any of the drugs or any of the stimulants they put in the cage because they had a community. They had a purpose. They had other things to do besides the drugs. And a lot of times the sin, as you mentioned it, it's kind of always done in in passing and mentioned. The sin is typically, it's in the dark, right? Sin loves the dark. It's not in the light. It's usually you're by yourself and then the devil and Satan tries to keep you there by telling you you're worthless, telling you no one will forgive you, telling you you can't go to anybody with this. And that's how he wants to keep you there until eventually you die. And you say, Jared, how can I get out of this? Come to church, get plugged in, get into a community and that stuff will will fade away with Christ working through your heart and Christ's people truly engaging with you and showing the, you the true love of Christ, not some righteous high horse. Yeah. How could you sin? Like he's, like the devil's not good at what he does. No. Oh, he's got here. a whole lot of practice. He's got a whole lot of practice. Come here, get plugged in and watch how Jesus can work in your life. Not only through the people you come in contact with, but through your own heart. And it's, well, that's, it's amazing to watch. Like you said, sin, sin always happens in the in a dark place mm-hmm. and you want to break it down sin the, the devil always gets you to sin as you're isolated like that you're by yourself or whatever and then not every sin is uh individual i mean obviously Correct. if you're in an affair or you know or sex out of wedlock that takes two to tango kind of thing right. but it's still in a it's still in a kind of isolate i mean nobody's really out in public doing no. that kind of thing so he keeps you isolated and then you struggle with it and you stay isolated and that's the problem like that you get when you get plugged into a, a godly community and yeah. a church body then instead of being isolated now you're insulated mm-hmm. to where yeah you're probably still going to struggle with it but you've got a lot of believers around you to help yep. build you up that's why we're not supposed to this this whole push on like tiktok and stuff where oh i don't need to go to church to have jesus no you don't need to go to church to have jesus but according to Hebrews, we're still supposed to gather as a body and build each other up and empower each other and help equip each other and those types of things. And like that, like, man, that's, that's how the enemy gets so many, yeah. the, the, whole, the whole thing with, with leaving the 99. And we're supposed the to be The wolves go after feet. the sheep that run away. Yeah. That's how we get attacked. When you mm-hmm. start splitting off of the body yep. and being isolated, like, no, you need to stay and be insulated mm-hmm. within the body. And, and, and that starts with getting into the body 
and then repenting and having true repentance, which I touched on in the very beginning, which is confession. Yeah. Confessing to God, which is basically agreeing with God about your sinful nature and what you've done and who you are. And then I would take it a step further as well as to confess it to whoever you feel needs to be confessed to in the situation you're in. Get that off your chest. The devil's going to tell you, don't do that. People are going to judge you. You might lose this relationship. You might lose that relationship. They're going to be mad at you. The devil is holding your sin against you as blackmail. He's yeah. holding that to, and eating at you to keep you in that silence of this echo chamber of yourself. And if there is another party, other party, you need to break that. And it's extremely freeing to confess and then repent, cut it off, and then the reconciliation can occur. And it's not, I think a lot of people get scared of reconciliation and the, the, the immediate thought is, well, how can I go back to being friends with that person? The relationship doesn't have to go back to being exactly the same. You don't have to be buddy-buddy or yeah. have the same relationship, but you can be reconciled and have a new relationship with new boundaries, new trust established, and continue on and, and help each other grow. And I think of... Um, in First Samuel and King Saul, where he's being tormented by those spirits. So you have these spirits that the, the devil doesn't just come once. And I think so many people prepare for one. Yeah. That they get worn down. And it's just, and it's little things. They see, you see these spirits or you get these little things over and over and over and over. And eventually it becomes too much to bear and you, you break down. And that's how the devil works. Think about people trying to lose weight to go to the gym. This is a, an analogy where it's, I want to go to the gym every day. They go super hard and they prepare and they're up at 4 a.m. and they get there the first two days and they're gone for three weeks because it, it was so hard, so much they prepared and they're so happy. I did it once that they were prepared for that battle. They weren't prepared for the war. Yeah. It's a daily, the daily bread. It's doing something every day. And you think about King Saul. He had David come in and play music for him. And it's, the Bible says that that helped alleviate some of the spirits. They would go for a time. And that's another thing I'd, I'd like to urge to the listeners, too, is the music has such a strong purpose. And the music is great and alleviate, but it didn't, it didn't get rid of the spirits. And I think so many people and that I've come in contact when they're dealing with stuff and you're talking to them, oh, I, I put on my praise music in the car and it was great. I'm feeling better now. Then they're back in the Go cycle. It's allevi it's, it, it alleviates <laughs> yeah. some of the spirits, but the spirits are still there. And when we look at the picture of how to deal with that, it's Jesus in the, in the wilderness, he didn't say, oh, this song is sorry. He said, it is written. Yeah. Every time he dealt with the devil, he said, it is written. He didn't sing the song. The devil is the, the chief musician. You might be singing a song that he wrote. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah I love this song. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead, like, sing keep, it. Keep going. Good job. He's you know? probably singing it with you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's important that if we have something that we're harboring deep, deep down, and we know it and we are terrified of it, that's because the devil is telling us to be terrified of it. Yeah. God's saying, it's dealt with, it's done, give it up. And if you won't do that, you're gonna have those, those daily torments, those daily things of um, these spirits just constantly nagging at you in this earworm. And that Jesus' word is that anointing oil. It's it's the anointing on our, our head of sheep. I don't know if you know this or if our listeners, but a lot of times sheep, the shepherds anoint their head with oil. Have you heard this before? I think so. Well, they anoint their head with oil to keep out the, some of the sheep ticks and yeah. some of the nose yeah. things that get in there and they lay eggs and they get into their brain as they start to hatch and it drives the sheep wild. Just these little things that are constantly in their head and they can't get them out until eventually the sheep like kill themselves or go insane. And Satan works the same way. He puts these things on our head. And if we don't, if we aren't anointed by Jesus and saved and, and covered in the blood, and we don't work on releasing those, it's going to drive you insane. It can lead you, it can lead you to death. Sorry, I've had somebody took their lives that's somewhat close to me that I found out about recently. And it's so heartbreaking to see what the devil can do to somebody and make them feel so isolated and the battles that people have going on in their heads. And honestly, I'm just so tired of and annoyed at Satan and his ability to continue to tell people that you're better off alone. Don't go talk to somebody that's about this. Get, that's and how it, it gets you. It's that's so that's aggravating that's... and I can't stress it enough. That's such a bad play on the devil. Bring it up. And to the Christians who have maybe been down that path, 
please get off of your high horse and stop looking at people that have sin problems like they're some sort of lepers. The devil is great at what he does. Acknowledge that. And when somebody is brave enough and strong enough to come to you in Jesus and say, I have this issue, by all means, help them. Yeah. Do not condemn them. No, it's, that's, that's <laughs> what's the, the, the weirdest thing in church culture is like the, the, the mindset of that you can just stop sinning. Uh, even though we are inherently sinners, we're born into sin. And yes, we're forgiven of our sin and everything, but until we get into glory, it's still going to be a problem that we deal with. The temptation it's, it's all in, the time. It's in us. That's why you're supposed to fight the good fight. That's, supposed, that's why you're supposed to endure until the end. If it was that easy, then everybody would do it. Everybody would just say, oh yeah, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And then boop, you're all made a good person and everything's perfect. But it's like, no, that's... Sin is a problem, and that's the whole thing with, like, grief and everything. Like, we were not supposed to be grieving over people that have died because we weren't supposed to be dying. Mm -hmm. And that is why grief is so heavy is because we weren't wired for grief. We were supposed to be living in harmony and everything. We weren't supposed... That's why sin is so disgusting. That's why it's, it's so hard on us because we simply weren't supposed to be living with it. We were supposed to be perfect beings with God, but it got it got wrecked. And so now we're dealing with the consequences. It's a brokenness. We were made perfect and we became broken. Yeah. And and, and that yeah. like man with with not being isolated. I talked to somebody today that dealt with something very similar to that and it was just the same thing like they go they go and they get away. I think that's a, a something that happens with a lot of people that take their own life is they mm-hmm. get into that loneliness and they mm-hmm. stay alone and then that's the that's where the devil gets the most attack on you. I mean, look at how hard he came after Jesus as Jesus was alone. It's alone. Mm-hmm. And so that's why you can't you can't isolate yourself. You've got to be within the body. You've got to find somewhere, you know, find a community to get plugged into and yep. and and like that, like confessing things to one another and that's actually something I just recently dealt with myself. I had um, something, you know, coming up, and I could feel that within me, like, you know, like, if this goes on anymore, I'm going to just get really, really mad and really frustrated. So I took the time to reach out to them and be like, hey, I'm just letting you know, like, I'm, I'm frustrated with this. You know, I'm trying to do this, trying to do that, whatever, whatever it was. It's just like, I'm, I'm frustrated with this, but I'm bringing it to you to air it out. Yep. Because I know if I don't bring it to you and I don't say anything, nothing's going to change, for yep. one. And then it eventually, it's going to keep progressing in the same path. And that's going to lead me to start having resentment and me to start having anger. And I don't want to deal with that. So yep. you have to take that. Yeah, it's kind of awkward at first, and you don't know how the other person is going to react. It's a muscle. It's a spiritual it. muscle. Yeah. We talk. We we do a lot of analogies with sports and weightlifting. When you go to the gym and you start lifting, the first be- I was a freshman in high school, very first. We had a bench max. I was five That's seven, right. five <laughs> seven, one hundred and thirty pounds, soaking wet, <laughs> and like, all right, we're going to go bench max, boys, and get our bench max. And here I am as a freshman, and I put you up. You were five seven, five seven, one thirty five. Second grade? No, this was freshman year. I was a little guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I put up 80 pounds on the bench, 80 pounds. And I was like, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. I couldn't even pretend. Like, that's bad. Uh, like 80 pounds on the bench. And I ran like an 8560, which is just crawling. And, but you do that, and your muscles are sore. Yeah. And it's awkward. But eventually, you strengthen those muscles through use and the recovery time isn't as long. You can go a little bit quicker, you do a little bit more, you don't have to wait as long. It's no different with our spiritual muscles, learning to go to somebody who we have faults against or with and, and talking that out, praying, praying without ceasing. You know, These are all spiritual muscles that need exercise. You can't just show up to the, to the gym and bench press 300 pounds if you haven't put in that work. Yeah, it's, and, not, it's and not warming up either. Yeah, you, like, you, have to, there's a process. you have to do this and you have to go through that process. Yeah, that, and even like with the gym, you try if you try to do too much too fast, you end mm-hmm. up hurting yourself in the, mm-hmm. in the process. That's I, I tore my uh, 
my rotator cuff a few years ago trying to bench too much. Too, I was I was trying to I, I was close to get it. lifting, huh? Well, yeah, I was working out with another guy that was much stronger than me, and I was close. Uh, I don't even want to say what it was because everybody's gonna be like, "No, that's a lie." It was a lot, <laughs> and I hadn't benched that much. I had gotten close, but that was like I had never pushed myself to that level, and I wasn't there yet, right. but I was close. But since I wasn't there yet, I ended up, I tore my shoulder, mm. and it was only a 25% tear, but that was some of the most excruciating pain that I've ever felt in my life. And, I mean, you can ask Kelsey, like, it took almost, it was about, a, and it still gets tight. Like, when I work out, if Did I don't warm it up, you? it's, huh? Did she tease you a lot? No. Cause, well, she, she, actually, had, she, she actually I felt bad for that one? A little bit. I'm, I don't remember now. It's such a traumatic experience. <laughs> um, it was, but it was so, I lost, like, 30 pounds. Like, I looked like I had, like, a disease. Like, it was fresh bad. Like, it, yeah, it was, it was rough. Like, I haven't been that skinny since like since high school pretty wow. much and it like it was bad and because but I couldn't put a shirt on yeah. without her helping me like I just couldn't move my arm and it's mm-hmm. just it's that whole process of uh, you think of like spiritually you mm-hmm. can't you can't just become a Christian yeah. and then think you're gonna go out and attack the whole demonic entertainment industry yep. or something like that yeah. like you can't you don't can't. know what you're getting into yet yeah <laughs> I, that's one of my things that the pastor say too we New, especially with new Christians, they get that you know the emotional yeah. wave, and it's like they're gonna they're ready they're gonna go charge hell with a squirt gun. And it's like hold on, buddy. Yeah. Like appreciate uh, the enthusiasm. I love the enthusiasm. Let's get the, the foundation like, laid. With my sports guys, like hey, I'm glad you're ready for the football game. You don't know how to tackle yet. Like yeah. we need to wear some fundamentals. We need to work on. But everybody wants that the six pack. Everyone yeah. wants the six pack and the strong arms or um, the spiritual ability to to cast out these demons and to do all these great things and but we're not do we're not exercising we just want to show up one day and expect it to be there and it's like no we walk around with this facade and it it's 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 really interesting to see it's just everybody wants god's full time benefits but he's their part time job yeah it's not going to happen they we we more often we treat him like he's a part time problem because you know, oh, I gotta, I gotta go to church on Sunday. Mm-hmm. I got, I gotta get up early for church. Oh, I gotta do this. I gotta do that. It's like, no, man, you get to. Like, mm-hmm. for one, you live in a country. Thank God yep. that we are free enough to to just do this, to be able to have the Bible on your phone and read the Bible, and not be persecuted. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that's coming one day. Um, but it's right now we're in that place where we have the freedom to do that, yeah. but we still treat it like it's nothing. Like we just take it completely for granted. And then like that, like we think, you know, we can just take on the whole world immediately. It's like, man, no, like you're, you're still, you got to take those baby steps and build up that foundation mm-hmm. of faith and, and, and grow and mature. And then, Man, to, like, to, to take it back to the beginning of the conversation, because I just thought of this as you were talking about it, with, with the tendency in America to like idolize the pastor mm-hmm. and try to walk out your entire faith through the pastor yep. to where it's, I'm not feeding myself during the week. Uh, I'm just coming on Sunday. Yep. You give me the meat and potatoes. Like, it's good. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll jump up and shout. But then as soon as we leave the parking lot, out of our minds, we're not going to watch it again. We're not yep. going to look at the notes if we even took any. We're just trying to walk everything out. That's a sermon I'm, I'm dying to preach. I'm going to get there one day. Is Because uh, I had last, last year, I did reach out and touch faith on the okay. woman with the issue of blood. Mm-hmm. And I want to, <laughs> off of stealing the Johnny Cash and Nine Inch Nails thing, I want to do one called Your Own Personal Jesus. And I want to dive in. I'll, I could either do it on, maybe I'll do it when um, we get to the woman or the women with the, the, the lamps okay. and the oil. Mm-hmm. But my original, when God like kind of first poured the idea into me was the sons of Sceva in okay. Acts 19. Okay. They are traveling Jews and they try to cast out a demon pretty much in Paul's name. You know, mm-hmm. they're like, oh, Jesus, you know, that Paul proclaims. And it's like, they don't have their own faith. They don't have their own walk. They're trying to do everything through someone else's footsteps and it completely backfires against them. So it's yeah. like, man, church America, you've got to realize the pastor is in charge of teaching you 
not, not 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 putting the spoon up to your mouth and making you eat the food. Mm-hmm. That's that's your decision to pick up that fork and spoon feed yourself to yep. you know to, to feed yourself off of what the pastor is bringing, which should be the overflow of what he's getting fed. But you have to walk out your own you race. To. You have to walk out your own faith. The, I can't I can't do yours. You can't do mine. Nope. There's there's uh, there's no way to do any of that. So you have to do it yourself. Do it. Otherwise, you have. <coughs> You have nothing, and you have you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's like that that the sons of Sceva, like they they couldn't do anything because mm-hmm. they were literally trying to do it through someone else. Yeah, I'm gonna get there one day. You gonna do that one? Uh, yeah, one day. My I, I'm still praying about what to do next, um, but I, I think we're gonna. Uh, it's gonna be one of the Gospels, and I think I know which one, but I don't want to say. <laughs> and we're just gonna, because I'm really enjoying. I've found <laughs> just just walking through the Bible with everyone, yeah. like with Jude, and even like the last one I really enjoyed. But it was looking back, I wish I could have, I should have taken my time more. But I think it was a good introduction into walking through. It was doing those big just overview of the chapter, but just walking through Jude and just going, you know, verse by verse and just taking our time. I, I feel like we're getting so much more out of that instead of. And not that there's anything wrong with it, but instead of like, you know, where you you come one Sunday and your Three pastor's preaching out of Romans, and then the next yeah. week he's in, you know, Daniel, and then the next week we're in Genesis, and then yeah. the next week we're in Galatians. And not that there's anything wrong with that. And there's not. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think for a lot of people, where we are now as, as a society and heading, you know, and being in the last days and needing to be... I think I just got my confirmation. Needing to be prepared <laughs> yeah. is we need to just learn the Bible and know the Bible. And I think that's natural just training through it. Yeah, that's that's a natural training though for anything really. I mean, you have a set regiment. So if you're weightlifting, you have Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or four days a week, you have push poles, whatever it is. You have a set regiment within that. You'll hit for a while yeah. until you mix it up. And then think about in school, if you were learning a math, like a quadratic formula is what pops into my head, but we're on quadratic formula for maybe a week until we understand yeah. that concept. And so when we're in Jude, like you are for two or three weekends in a row or four weekends with an overview, and then we're kind of diving in, it's so much easier especially for the people that maybe only come that once and don't take notes, it's a lot easier because of the consistency of it to really understand what is happening in the book of Jude that they can take home with them and be able to store inside uh, their heads and inside their hearts to kind of have forever as opposed to, as you said, we're going to talk about this topic whatever it is, false prophets and Jude today, three, you know, three poems and a prayer, we're out of here. And then next week we're going to talk about lying and this, and it's, you start to learn this, but you don't really learn the books and the authorship. You get like that broad, you get a very broad sense of, of yeah, Jesus and the gospel. I'm loving it. it. And it's, Mm -hmm. what's crazy too, is it's, it's only 25 verses, but it's just jam packed with all this stuff. And like, that's, that's the testament to We're to not even studying. to the next ones about the, the waves and the foam, and the, we're not even there yet. We're no, still in the... yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like <laughs> there's so much, and like that, that's what I was going to say, like with Bible study, I mean, you read this, and it's 25 verses, okay? And you could read it in 10 minutes or less mm-hmm. and move on to the next. But if you want to study your Bible like that, you just go and slow down and go back over it. Okay, well, he's bringing up Jesus rescuing people out of Egypt. Well, I thought that was Moses. Let me go back and look. Yeah. How can I find Jesus in there? Oh, the pillar of fire. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you know, and then the next thing. And then like Cain and, and Balaam and Korah. And it's just like you can get that one line and that one word and then just go back and, and now you're just devouring scripture <laughs> instead of just devoting, you know, a couple can minutes. Can we talk on about Sunday. human nature for a second? They walked by a pillar of fire and were fed manna from heaven. And steak. And, and we have <laughs> we have people today, and I'm guilty of this as well, where you say how could our world get this way? How could people do, like, how could people do this or forget about this or turn their backs this way? And it was gone, what, 40 days? Within 40 days of yeah, <laughs> them being in being the wilderness gone. and being led by pillars of fire and fed from And manna. seeing and still like, you know the, what? the thunder mm, and the lightning and the clouds. We're around. done with this now after 40 days. It's no wonder. Then I look around our nation. Yeah, it's no wonder 
people are the way they are. They haven't really been led by a pillar of fire in the last, you know... It's being desensitized. 300 years, but it's being desensitized. And that's where I've gone with you and talking about, like, miracles. You don't see those miracles, but the miracles today, I think, are in the people. Yeah. Um, it's not just... The, the crazy story that happens on the news where somebody's in the hospital and comes back to life, but it's it's more of the, like, Jason's story, which is so fantastic, of I'm on the verge of, you know, the fast track straight to hell with what seems like pure hopelessness, and now here I am serving in a community, getting tied into the church, and what a great story that is, and it's, it's a miracle that he's here. It's a miracle that you're alive with some of the stories you have from your line work, and we don't see the miracles today because the devil has us going back to what we talked about before, keeping us in isolation and keeping our testimonies and keeping all that sin in the dark. And the, I say this a lot, the magnitude, the magnitude of the miracle is in the mess that it came from. Understanding where something came from oh, yeah. gives the magnitude to how amazing this miracle is, but nobody's sharing their mess anymore. No. No one's exactly. sharing the before photo. They only want to wait and work in silence to the after photo, and more people fail than succeed going that route because the devil's good at what he does. So I encourage those that are listening and those just, or whoever happens to see this, whether it's at this church or another, go confess your sin. Get it off of your chest. Go talk to somebody. Confess that sin. Get it off your chest. Get plugged in and share the mess that you're in so that you can one day have a miracle that people can look back on and go, oh my gosh, this was once this and now it's this. There's no other way that that's possible but by God. That's what, that's, I love hearing testimonies, especially the ones that are just, that it was so dark because God chooses those darkest moments to shine the brightest. That way he gets the most glory. I mean, when it looks the worst and it just looks like it's getting even worse, that's when he can turn it around. So he gets all the credit and then it's just an amazing testimony. But I think like that, like human nature and you know, the 40 days and then he comes down and, they, and then we just, Oh, we threw this gold in there and now popped a calf, <laughs> which <laughs> That's just, I don't even want to go there, but yeah. wow. But like that, and now it's like, you think now with like fast food and entertainment and mm -hmm. the amount of different, just uh, streaming platforms and shows oh, yeah. to where uh, we'll, we'll make... We'll make dinner and sit down to watch TV, oh. and the food's cold by the time you pick something because you just want to watch something while you eat, and then your food's cold because you spent three hours trying to find <laughs> the right you know thing, and oh, this one wasn't good, so you go to the next, and the entertainment value, and then it's like that, like... Like we were talking about with the billionaires that end up becoming, you find out they're into just all this crazy stuff and it's just the desensitizing, and I think that's like that with the Israelites. They saw... They saw so much. I you mean, walk the, through the walls of water. Walls of water. On, on dry, and I think some people pass over yeah. that too. On dry ground, there wasn't even like mucky, no. wet sea bottom. The ground was dry. Yeah. It's, it's wild. It's wild. And have that, and yeah. then the cloud by day, and the pillar of fire, and then, you know, Moses on the mountain, and they can see the lightning, they can hear the thunder, you can see the clouds and all this stuff swirling around, but it's just like, they saw it, and then they just got desensitized. It just became, they got used to it. Yep. And it was like, it stopped, they stopped being in awe of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have done, is... Uh, he's still moving, and he oh, still does still miracles. Moving. And there's all of these things. If you stop and just turn and 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 look for it, if you look for him, if you look for God, you'll find. You'll it. find him exactly. But you we find just get to the point for. where it's like, you know, we're expecting to see the pillar of fire mm -hmm. instead of realizing. I'm only here breathing today by the grace of God, allowing me to wake up. I'm still walking. I'm still breathing. Yep. I can see the sun came out. Like, there's all of these things that he's so still rich performing miracles and all of that. But mm. it's like we're just channel surfing, yep. trying to find, well, you know, uh, yeah. you know, that's cool. I'm awake. Well, I didn't see, you know, oh, man, I don't want to get, like, too bad. But it's like, well, you know, yeah, I'm alive. But... You know, he didn't heal my grandmother. 
Mm-hmm. He didn't heal my grandfather, you know. Oh, he hasn't done this yet, and he hasn't done that, and we just keep channel surfing. We're waiting for him to, like... What a self-centered view of God, though, when we get to that. Well, he didn't do this for me. He didn't do that for me. God is not here for us. We're here for God. God did not die... Well, he did die on the cross for our sins. He did that. <laughs> but we were made in his image. Yeah. We were made for him. He wasn't made for us in terms of the entertainment and just giving us everything we want. He came to die for us, to reclaim us, and to yeah. buy us back and to purchase our pardon. Um, but we have such a self, especially an American, the American dream. And that goes back to the American dream, white picket fence and all these big aspirations. And that falls into American Christianity. All these, I want, I want the stage and I want the podcast and I want this and I want the big calling where I'm going to go save 400 kids or we want all these big things. That's the American Christianity dream of having that versus just what God called us to do, which is share the gospel, yeah. share his love. And it's, it's very, it's very interesting to pay attention to who's like, oh, the will for my life is to be a pastor or the will, the God's will for my life is to be a baseball player. Or God's will for my life is to be this or be that. What happens if he, if those abilities are taken away? So God's will for your life is not that you're going to be a pastor. God's will for your life is not that you're a professional baseball player. God's will for your life is that you share the gospel, and he's put you in these specific platforms to do so. And if that platform gets taken, his will for your life has not changed. You're just going to get a new platform. That's why... That's why American pastors, pastors in general, and and just Christians, street preachers, whatever, people on TikTok, we need to quit quit preaching for vanity and we need to start preaching from victory. Mm-hmm. You know, we've already we've already got the victory through Jesus. We need to start pointing people back to that victory. Like the battle's already been fought, it's already been won. There's nothing we need to do other than to just go out, preach the gospel, proclaim the truth, and win people back for Jesus, win people back to Jesus, because that's the whole goal. That's the Great Commission, and it was like, <laughs> yeah. people quit looking at the Bible like it's full of commandments, and we're looking yeah. at it like it's, it's <clears throat> options, and we hear the Great Commission, and you're like, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't know the words to say. It, do you think God cares about that? Like, no. He right. said, go do this. If something as simple as, man... I've been a Christian for 10 minutes, but my whole life feels incredibly different. Like, you need to come to church with me and experience this. And it was, it's like that, something yeah. that simple. But instead, we're like, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't That's know. It's scary thing. to talk yep. to people. God. But, man, if they mess up your order at that fast food restaurant, you're going to be chewing them out at the window and freaking out and leaving a bad review on Yelp. And, and <laughs> not going not and, me. It, no? <laughs> I make Amanda do it. That's that terrifying. I'll, I don't, I'll, I'll I'm just not, eat it I don't or I'll just give it away and be like, I'm hungry. I'll just go hungry or give it away. Yeah, Um, you messed mine up. I'm not saying nothing. Yeah, God's calling. God's calling on our lives to the American church. God's calling and our will for our lives is not an occupation; it's obedience. We're looking for God's call in an occupation. Well, yeah. what is God calling me to do? I.e., what am I supposed to do with my life? Am I supposed to be a vlogger, a pastor, a missionary, uh, this or that? We're looking for an occupation handed down from God, and God's handing us down obedience. Be obedient. That's my calling on your life is to do what I tell you to do, to preach the gospel, and I will give you platforms to do so that could change constantly. Your dad's in a season of change right now. Who knows what his next platform might look like, but the calling and will of God in his life has not changed. It's to reach the lost. It's to redeem those and bring those back to Christ and to encourage those that are already believe and those that are in the body to continue to run their race and to keep up the fight and to go the distance. Obe- I like that. Obedience, not occupation. That goes a lot too with what I was saying Sunday is that the whole thing is about discovery. We're supposed to be obedient to God. We're supposed to, instead of, and that's a big problem, because I'm guilty of this myself, where, you know, you're like, you hear, you come to church and hear all about purpose. Well, I don't, I don't know God's purpose for my life. I don't know my purpose. I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know his will for my life. Well, like that right there, his will is that you are obedient, that you serve him, that you go and and make disciples. will is exactly the same for everybody. And if you, if you just start living that and you start Mm -hmm. truly following him and devoting your life to him and and being devoted to that relationship and then just trying to share the gospel as you walk out that obedience Mm -hmm. he'll give you the occupation he'll give you the opportunity and then you find your purpose simply just by walking through servanthood exactly even the new testament they all had the same thing 
you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all have the same thing. They're all going out, but they're, they were writing to different people, right? It's the same, like, God's purpose and will for everyone's life is the same in so much that it's sharing the gospel, loving one another, and trying to rescue those from the pits of hell and bring them to Christ so Christ can redeem them and they can accept him as ah. your Lord. Kelsey said, why don't we have a door dash? I cannot share that story on a church platform. Oh, but it really? is my fault. It is your fault? <laughs> we'll just say... Well, um, another time. We ordered food, and the DoorDash person stole it. And I was not saved, and I was very angry. And that's what we'll leave that story with. <laughs> um, it's human nature, right? Yeah, no, yeah sinful nature. <laughs> but uh, his next... <laughs> Um, oh man, what were, what were you just saying? Because I just had something. The will, the will, and the purpose for everybody is more or less the same. Yeah. How, no, oh, how you go say. about achieving that for His kingdom is different. Like, you're going to go share the gospel, but it, yeah, it might be a children's ministry, or you might connect with athletes, or you might connect with single mothers, or there's something there. But the will and the purpose of everybody is the same goal. It's reaching the lost, sharing the hope that is found in Jesus Christ for those that are gone to repent of their sins, accept them as their savior, and to one day find their eternal home in heaven. It's all the same for everybody, just who it's to and how it's being performed varies. And to tie that into the whole thing earlier with um, the like hiding your mess mm -hmm. and everything, like that, like we all, everybody's got a past. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unless you just completely grew up in church and did nothing, then, you know, more power to you. Some of us wandered and went our own way and everything. But I think a lot of people that, like that, we tried to hide our mess. We tried to hide our testimony. And it was like everything that you went through before you came to Jesus mm -hmm. has a purpose. 100%. So like that, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... Luke was a, a doctor, a physician. Mm -hmm. Matthew was a tax collector. collector. Yep. So as a tax collector, he would have known how to find, <laughs> find genealogies and trace people's family line back and all that. And what is Matthew open with? The genealogy of Jesus Christ that goes mm -hmm. back to Ab or, uh, yeah, Abraham. Right. Um, and it was like, man, his, his past equipped him to be able to do that, to be able to find mm -hmm. that. And also being smart being able to write and read that way he could write down the things and we have his gospel. I think it was what, like for the church for a thousand years, like that was what they learned off of was the gospel of, of Matthew. And it was like, man, every everything you've gone through before equips you to do 100%. whatever God has called you to do. And it's like, even if you went through absolute hell and, you know, like, your life was a mess, like, just a strung-out drug addict for all this time. And your purpose is to, even if it's just to reach one person through that testimony, mm -hmm. that is just, that's just beautiful. Like, mm -hmm. that, that, that you get to spend, yes, eternity with Jesus, and that's ultimately the, the, the goal and the blessing. Right. But also to, to know, that's what I was saying Sunday, like, to just know that my, I lived my wife, my, my wife, my <laughs> life in a way... Where even just reaching one person, even just, just yep. one soul, to have just one person come up and like, I know Jesus simply because yep. of you. Like, that is, that's, a, that's a blessing to me. Mm -hmm. And that's something I hope to see uh, a lot, at least just once. But man, that's, that's the whole thing. Just everything you've gone through leading up until this point, um, even if you're still going through it and you're still struggling it with it, purpose. God uses it for his glory. It has a purpose. It has a purpose. And that's just I something, mean, even if you're dealing with something now yeah. and you, you don't believe yet, you know, and I steal it all the time and I say, you know, you do belong before you believe God. You already belong to God, mm -hmm. uh, even, even when you don't believe him. And you could be watching this and maybe this ends up on a reel and you think it's just a big bunch of hocus pocus crap. God still loves you and he's still chasing you. Mm -hmm. And everything you've gone through, no matter how bad or how dark it is, he's using it for his glory, for his good. And you're thinking, oh, well, you know, why would a good God, the, the age-old argument, why would a good God make hell? Why would a good God send people to hell? That was never his intention. His intention was never that there was sin. His intention, that hell was created for the demons, not for humanity. But we're the ones that choose to go there because we reject him and we try to go on our own sinful way. But God's, that God's, whole, God's whole thing, his whole purpose 
that he put forth in the world was to glorify him and to be in yes. harmony with him. But yes. we, we wrecked that. Um, and, and now we deal with the consequences of that. Like mm-hmm. the design was never for there to be disease or death no. or famine or, you know, murder or, or theft or adultery. None of that was in the design. Obviously he knew it was there yep. and he still chose to create us out of his goodness and his love and his kindness. And he's patient enough yep. to continue to withhold his hand. But obviously that hand is not going to be withheld forever. No. And you know, that's when you feel the, the conviction and the grip and the guilt of sin, that's when you know God's hand is still on your life. Um, yep. When you still struggle with sin, that's how you know you still have the you Holy have, Spirit. Yeah, you if you're not struggling with yep. it and you're just full-blown abandoned to it and you mm-hmm. feel nothing about living with your girlfriend or looking up the wrong stuff on the internet or doing drugs mm-hmm. or doing this or doing that or going out and robbing people at gunpoint and you feel nothing about that, then that's when God's hand is not on your life. Yes. And that's the hardest place to try to come back from and to try to reach. And, you know, like Jesus says, no man comes to the Father but by me. And I, I pray for anybody that's like that, that Jesus... Yeah, it's a dangerous road. They get going you out of that. Uh, so far where even the Bible says they've they've been given over to a reprobate mind. They're too far, like they're so far gone. Their heart's so hard and that's been connected to that mind for so long that they've just been given over to it. It's just, it's so far gone. And it's not that, again... God can't redeem them. It's that they are not in a position to be redeemed. Their ground is not tilled up. It's hard ground. And God isn't going to just come in and till up the ground necessarily for you. Yeah. Meaning whether you like it or not, he's not going to do it against your will. There's people out there actively avoiding God. The Bible says a divorcing of the truth. They're actively walking away from God. They're hardening their hearts. God can't redeem them, not because he lacks the ability to do so, but because they reject them. They reject him and they're actively going the other way. So, which is another great, you know, Bible doesn't mince words. It doesn't say that people won't be in the faith or that people won't trust God. It says there's a divorcing of the truth. Well, divorce only comes from what? Being Ma- married. Married. So the divorcing of the truth is people that are married. They're, these are going to be Christians that know the word of God, that believed in Jesus Christ and are willingly and blatantly walking away from the faith. They are divorcing the truth. They are choosing to say, I am no longer going to go in this way. It's not a bunch of lost people necessarily saying, oh, and they're continuing because they never knew. They weren't married. There's no divorce there. They were never in it to begin with. Yeah. This divorcing of the truth is going to be people that so-called believers, and they're going to say, no, I'm gone, yeah, and they're that out. whole, you know, oh, I tried that Jesus thing, or, you know, as, as we, we hear it called now, the de- deconstructing mm-hmm. is what I think they always say now. I'm deconstructing my faith, and, you know, maybe there are traditions in, in, in church hurt and people hurt mm-hmm. and stuff like that that has affected you, but the whole deconstructing thing is really just another tool from the devil to just complete you, completely get you to just disconnect. Because mm-hmm. ultimately, as far as I've seen with these people that do this stuff, they don't, they don't deconstruct. They end up just fully disconnecting. Yeah. And, it, man, like, like Jude says you know, twice dead. Like that's mm-hmm. worse than the first situation because you, you were dead in your sins and then you, you were raised to life in Jesus, but now and, yeah. ultimately you're dead again because you, your roots are gone. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's going to be sad. Yeah. But again, we, we made, we're made aware of it. We know it's going to happen. Jude tells us again, beware of the false prophets that slip in. You're going to have people walking away. You're going to have false prophets. So it becomes even more imperative, like you said, to be in the word, to be in fellowship, to show up to church, to be fed sermons, but also feed yourself the scripture and your time with God and really start to strengthen your knowledge and your, your relationship with Jesus so much so that you can tell when something's off as we talk about yeah. with the counterfeiting dollars. So to... Um, uh... To contend for the faith. Have to. Have to contend for the faith. (sighs) Wow. How far, how long did we go? I mean, we're we're over an hour. We're good. (laughs) My computer's going to die there in a minute. Um, You you brought up the the waves thing. Mm -hmm. The The next verses that are coming up. Mm -hmm. What was that? We'll hit that quick before I run out of battery on here. I I was just saying, like, hey... 
there's even more to this chapter. We're on what eleven through thirteen. Yeah, and you have as the the phone comes in. Like, oh, it, there's a lot. Yeah, more to the unpack. the foam, the the mess, the wild way, and it the was wind, the clouds that do nothing. everything like, that they just go around casting shade. I love that. I like think that? the older crowd didn't get it because you like you had to explain yeah. what, what, what. I was said it. One? What was the other one you had to explain? <laughs> it wasn't Riz. It was. Uh, something else. Oh, know. I said plug. Plug. Yeah. And my plug, dad was like, like what? <laughs> <laughs> a drug dealer. So I don't, I think, I think for some of the older crowd and you're like, oh, let's go around casting shade on people. Like they didn't get the connection. Yeah. Like that's like a false prophet. They're going around casting shade. I mean, they're just, they're just talking crap. They're making yep. up lies, spreading gossip. Putting you in darkness. That's putting you in darkness. That's what casting shade is. And like a, a young lingo yeah. sort of translation. I didn't think about that when I said, cause when I said, it, I was like, when Ooh. you said it, I was like, yeah. Oh yeah. There, there it yeah. is. And then like, <laughs> When it was quiet, and I was like, "Oh man," <laughs> that was one of those ones. I was like, "Oh, I think that was good," but then it was quiet, so I was like, "Ah, oh, well, whatever." God's striking me down a peg. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that, like that, like the um, the waves, the waterless crowd, crowds, the waterless clouds, the the waves, the wandering stars. It's all they're all pictures of something that looks promising, mm-hmm. but in the wrong hands. They produce nothing. So, you know, like that, like the water is clouds, like they're not pouring anything out. They're just, they're just throwing shade, keeping you in darkness. And then they get blown along with the wind. They go from this church to that church, to that church, to that church, because ultimately, you know, they, they go somewhere and they look like they're bringing something to um, the area that Mm -hmm. they're in, but then they don't pour anything out. So eventually people hopefully see them for their fruit yeah. and then they I just get blown along and go to the next place. Yeah. I mean, we could go off on yeah. that. It just because we've had it in my old church. It happens everywhere. It's just so fascinating to me to hear the amount of people that go church to church or move churches when you ask them very rarely. Like I think maybe three times in my life I've ever heard someone say, well, we left the church because they were biblically unsound. It's like, oh, the carpet was a different color. I didn't like the music. So I left because of the carpet? Yeah, like, yeah, well, oh. yeah, we get complaints. Like, we didn't like they spent money on this carpet color and it's brown instead <laughs> of green, or the music this, or they brought this in, or they did this. And it's never Jesus. It's never, I left because it's biblically unsound. It's always, it just didn't fit my preferences, or I just didn't like it, or I got offended by the people and they don't work it out. They just leave. And if you don't, as we learned before, if you don't, work on reconciliation, Yeah, you go to a new church, you bring all that hurt and pain with you to a new place and it gets poured out and other people. And it's like, be very weary of some of those people. You and I talked about this a little bit where it's like people that are really good interviewers are good interviewers for a reason because they go on a lot of them because they float around. People that join churches easily and get like immediately plugged in, and they start doing things so well, and like, wow, these people just came right in. They're doing this, and they were down the road at this church, and now they're here, and they're willing to. Vo- a lot of people church and join churches so easily and get so involved so easily because they do it a lot, and it, it's just, it's just, it's tough to be weary. And I just, it's hard to hear so many people walk away from churches and cause division and cause strife over preferences. And then you have, like you said, the false prophets in core, they go around and you whisper and you try to bring more people with you. And it's just so aggravating to me because we're missing the point. Yeah, We're missing the point. Like I, I think I said this uh, to somebody, it's like so many churches nowadays and the congregations are fighting over believers. Oh, come to our church, come to our church, come to our church. And it's, they spend so much time, they spend so much time, it's almost like the campaign trail. Yeah. And like just these smear tactics that are usually false on all accounts. And it's like, you know what? Stay where you were, reconcile. Or if you have a leave because of a true biblical issue, leave because of a true biblical issue. And also leave in the right manner. Don't just pick up tent overnight and leave. Yeah. Go to the pastor. Talk about your issue. Say, hey, I don't think this was biblically accurate. Can you explain this? Can we talk about this? Try to reconcile. And if not, then take the appropriate I had, steps. I had, I had some of that when I first started because um, I brought up, it was, uh, I don't remember what sentence. It was one of the first ones I did, and it was on Moses and how Moses' name um, was like Egyptian. Mm-hmm. And somebody emailed me. And they're like, well, what, what was up with that? You know, where was that? And I had to like give them the, right. the thing on where I found it and everything. But I mean like that, like that, that's what's one of my biggest frustrations too. They're, pa- they're pastor seeking see, and not Jesus seeking. Yeah. They're, they're coming 
for the wrong reasons, essentially. And there's nothing... On one hand, there is nothing wrong with preferences. There's nothing wrong with preferences. Um, because, yeah, like, I, I enjoy a certain type of music, yep. and... There's nothing wrong it's, with it's, it. <laughs> it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with the preferences, like you said. Yeah, and, and there's, there's nothing. But the problem is when we idolize it's it. It's when you idolize it. And if you're not getting fed, like if you're there, and like you said, yeah. the word is good, it's accurate, but for some reason it's just not connecting with me. Again, perfectly fine. We're not competing over you. We're trying to reach the lost. Yeah. We're trying to encourage you and reach the lost. And if you're not getting the encouragement or you're not feeling fulfilled, there's a better way to do it than to say, I'm not feeling fulfilled. Who's coming with me? We're out of here. Yep. As opposed to saying, hey, I love, I sat in your services a handful of times. I thought what you preached was accurate. It was strong as good. It just, I was just having trouble getting filled. So I'm going to go try somewhere else. Yeah, I like appreciate not your time. Style. There's a different you know, like way to handle worship. that. Yeah, there's a way to handle that and there's a way not to handle that. And a lot of times, most of the offense doesn't just necessarily come because they left. A lot of times it comes from how people leave. Again, going back to how things happen. It's not, it's the trust. It's the breaking of the trust because you're not going to the the source. Yeah. And they just, we, we end up, we do it like Cora mm -hmm. and we just, you know, you think even like, like, like Aaron and Miriam and, and Cora, they could have easily came up to Moses. Hey, you know, what's up with it? You know, we're feeling mm -hmm. this way or something. We're, we're kind of struggling with, you know, you think about the, the, the guy in the new Testament, I believe help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. It's the same kind of aspect, really. I mean, it's you know, you come up, hey, I'm struggling with this. You know, I think you're 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 good in this aspect and all that, but I'm struggling with this. But we don't do that. We just, like you said, like, hey, I, I don't like this, so I'm gonna find ten other people that don't like this, and we're gonna go rip them out of somewhere and mm -hmm. leave behind the foam of their you know their shame, mm -hmm. and just leave them behind this disgusting mess instead of just being like, man, like you know, there's there's nothing wrong with preferences. I I don't. Mm -mm. It, I don't care about that. The, the problem right. is when we have idolized them and we have just set it practically above God where it's like, you know, we think if it doesn't look the way that we want, yep. we don't see God yeah. in it. And that's exactly why the Pharisees rejected Jesus and a lot of other people is because he didn't come how they thought he would come. Mm -hmm. They thought he was going to be this militant leader that was going to overthrow the Roman government yep. and all this. And was like, man, y'all completely missed the point because you were looking for what you wanted yeah. instead of what God was working out. Yeah, that's huge. And, it, and it's kind of like, well, Jared, how do I know if my preferences are a problem or not? I, I would say, and again, it's so hard because it's not a black and white issue, but if your preferences are blocking your ability to receive the preaching, they might be too strong and out of prioritization. Yeah. Your, your preferences might be above being fed from the preaching. Um, I had, an and, and I, don't, I don't know if it's something to Again, share. I won't say It's not black names. and white. It's a gray. There was room there to do. But I had, I had when I started, there was a couple people that kind of, I don't know, butt heads a little bit. And there was a couple, they didn't, they weren't, my, it was obviously my style is completely different than my dad's. Yeah. And I talked to him about that this morning and to, to just like real quick with like the idolization is like, if I wasn't different than him and I preached exactly the same way that he preached, like exactly the same, mm -hmm. the church would not grow. Mm -hmm. And that's not a testament to him doing a poor job right. or him not able to grow something. It's a testament to he's grown it here, and it's not saying he can't grow it anymore, but we will only stay stagnant at this level if I was exactly the same as him. You only get the crop you plant the seed for. Yeah. You guys preach. You guys are preaching your seeds. You have one type of seed. Your dad has one type of seed. Yeah. It's going to grow that type of crop. It's fascinating. I'm a, so I'm in marketing. I do a lot of consumer behavior and watching how people consume things. And it's fascinating to watch. In churches, it is very true that a lot of the congregation ends up being very similar to who they're being fed from. It's the same kind of plant. So the yeah. church we came from came from a very, like our pe preacher was, um, he was military for an army and he was very, um, he was raised in a, I don't say fire and brimstone, but strong standards. And, yeah. you know, we're suit and tie and not that that goes beyond anything because we're in the country. People come in their overalls all the time. That's never an issue. It's just, you know, I was raised this way. I'm 
You know, yeah. I'm going to put my best on for Jesus, suit and tie, straight and narrow. And a lot of the congregation, my dad included, the men and the people that receive that type of instruction well often are very similar to them in just how they think, how they deal, their mannerisms, how they deal with adversity, all very similar. And so if your dad were to continue to preach, the church, like you said, it might grow, but a lot of the people that he attracts are all going to be very much of the same people, probably hardworking, bootstrap guys, blue collar, honest, high character yeah. sort of things. And maybe not as I don't know, flamboyant's not the right word, but demonstrative <laughs> as we are, yeah. like, as you are like, hey, I'm out, like, we're, we're getting after it. We're <laughs> punching stuff. We're hitting, like, we're passionate. Yeah. You'll see the more you preach, the more people that come in are going to be more like you because your seed grows a certain type of crop. Which yeah. could th- then there's room to, there's room to discuss, like, hey, that's, that's pretty true. And so there might be some value in, like your dad's saying, every once in a while I'm preaching. Like we're mixing yeah. up. We're going to have a, a bunch of crops here. We're not yeah. just going to have corn. Like we're going to have a field of harvest that can then go out and reach those people. Um, so it's, it's interesting to think about, but it's not, I mean, that's, that's why. Like if you're sitting there going, well, I wonder why. Like yeah. it's because you guys are a certain type of seed and you're going to grow that crop from that seed. Yeah, that's, that's spot on. It's just, it's, it's. From from the wrong with that. pastoral <laughs> standpoint, it's just that that whole thing with like the preferences. It just it gets so frustrating because, like you were saying, like it, we have I have a, a sermon idea I wrote down months ago called "Confused Christians," and we it's like we're not even doing the commission anymore. We're just mm-hmm. fighting each other. We're not yeah. fighting the dominion of darkness. We're not fighting the enemy. We're not trying to take anything back from the gates of hell. We're simply just fighting each Arguing other. Arguing over semantics. Over. Over, you know, right now, <laughs> somebody will get mad that we're wearing a hoodie. Somebody will get mad that we're wearing a hat. I sent you the one about the guy, the beards. Yeah, like the beards, like, which is, I've never even heard that one. It's semantics. And it, again, that's where it's like, that's, we're missing the point. We're missing like, a lot because then the, the lost point. see that. The lost see that. And they're they like, well, anything. I don't want no part of that. Look at this. Exactly. This and is why church is a joke. Oh, I can't remember. I cannot remember who it was, the name. I could find this story probably. My, my old pastor talked about this once. It was someone from Russia, communist leader, a dictator. One of them came to America and sat in one of, at the time, one of the largest like Baptist churches in America. I think it was in Boston or New York, New England area. Sat through the service and was asked about it and said, everything that they preached about, like everything in the Bible that they preached about was amazing. It was true. It was one of the best things I've ever heard in my life, but there's no way it can be true. And they said, why can't it be true? Because if it was true, the people that were in there wouldn't receive it like that or act like that. Because there's no way that the Bible's true. Because if it was, they wouldn't act like that. And he went back home to Russia and ended up becoming one of the world, like a communist leader, dictator. I have to find the name and who it was. But that, that goes back to saying, like, the world sees us and goes, hey, you know what? I don't want to be a part of that. Because that looks like a lot of backstabbing and bickering over nothing. There's yeah, you get enough of that out in the world, and then it's like right. the, you and come it's over to the church. Mo- it's over little things, and it's like worse. Oh, it, yeah, it's always it's, it's the dumbest things. It's the dumbest things. It's, it's annoying. The, it's and again, if you have, and that goes back to, to if you have preferences, fine. And if you need, if you feel called to leave because the preferences are getting in the way of you receiving the word. Again, fine. But there's a way to leave. There's a way to go about it. And the Bible lays out that example with Miriam and Aaron, their, their family. Hey, I'm going to come to you. Why? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever those are, lay them out. Not, I'm not going to tell them about it. I'm just going to go around, get a bunch of the leaders from the church or a bunch of the people that and are important. Disappear. That are a bunch of the people that are important to their ministry and then just disappear overnight and leave them yeah. shorthanded. That's not how that's handled. And that's where the issue is. It's not that you have preferences and feel you need to leave. It's the manner in which you do it. Yeah, you turned your preferences and, into because God's after our heart, path. and that goes that goes with a lot of other things too. God talks about He wants our heart. It's like how you tithe. Are you tithing with a joyful and generous heart, or are you tithing out of disgust and obedience? Like yeah. I guess I got to do this. God doesn't want that. No, <laughs> God doesn't want that at all. That's like what is it's it? Like, they, the in the Old Testament where He literally tells him like your sacrifices make me nauseous yeah. because it was out of it was yeah. just routine instead of out of mm-hmm. their heart. Like you literally made. They made so many sacrifices the wrong way that it was just, it literally made God sick. Mm-hmm. 
And it's just like that. Like we spend. That's yeah. that's one of my biggest. Like a man said, I like your Jesus, church. but not your Christians. Yeah. Yep. That's what it is. And and then I mean, it's like that. The world. I think that's why a lot of people don't come to church or. They came and then they got out of it and then they look at the state that it's in. They're like, this is exactly why I don't go because I fight with my friends and my coworkers out here. They're doing it in there. Like, why, why would I want any part of that? They, they say that they love everybody, but all they do, do is go, each other and gossip. And then when you do go, you have the, oh, well, I got to go. I wish I could. But I yeah. got to go to church instead of, no, nah, sorry, don't ever put me down. I'm going to church. It's amazing. You yeah, should come. Exactly. There's a big difference in what that person is hearing you say. And, and how you say it. It's like, oh, they're actually enjoying themselves. Yeah. Like there's something. You start saying, there. I got to go to church. And then when something happens Nobody's in coming. your life, like we've, we've received this a lot. And it's, it's a little overwhelming because to us, it's like, I don't know what we're doing. We're just walking by faith, right? Where we've lost our, we've lost our little baby, our little stillborn baby. And all we can do is walk by faith and go, God has a purpose. And we, we, don't stress about it. We go through this hardship and people look at us and we've had comments like, I don't know how you guys are handling this so well. I don't know how you're doing this, how you're able, like you're con- like Amanda gets us a lot where Amanda ends up consoling other people for her problems, right? <laughs> like Amanda's going through stuff. Like when we had our, our marriage issues, like that I put on her cause I'm a horrible person. Like <laughs> she's going through these issues and other people are breaking down for her and she's like, it's fine. It's okay. Like God's got yeah. this. Like I've like, and they're like, how do you, how do you have such, it's like, just walk, we're walking That's, by faith. Like it's hard. Oh, Christ in it's you. not, it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. You know, yeah. you and I have talked about that a lot too. There's a difference between simple and easy. Running a marathon is super simple. It's one foot in front of the other for 26 miles. Yeah, There's no that. other steps. <laughs> it's literally just right, left, right, left, right, left. Super simple, but it's not easy. No. So... <laughs> Again, for us, it's like, okay, it's a simple decision. We got to serve God. We just got to walk by faith. It's not easy, but it's simple. <sighs> no, that, yeah, no, that's. And people see that. I guess what I was getting at is that the people will see that and go, oh, wow. Like, yeah, I, no, can't, imagine, I can't imagine a strength like that, that looking. peace beyond understanding. And then they want to figure out what drives that. It's the same thing you see a Honda going 300 miles an hour down the road. That makes you go, what's in that engine versus yeah. a Lamborghini? If a Lamborghini goes 300 miles on the road, you go, oh, it's, a, the, it's a Lamborghini. A Honda? Sure this, the mm. speed of light is faster than the speed of sound, right? Uh, I think I'm so. I'm pretty sure, because I had I that so. in one of my first sermons when I preached it in the youth, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm correct. I think so. But, and I had, I had twisted it. It was on, you know, Shining. It was called, I called it The Shining. It was you on would, being a light would, in the world. reader. Right? Goodness. The book was much better than the movie. Um... <laughs> But my, my thing was I brought up, I'm pretty sure, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I brought up the speed of, of light versus the speed of sound. And just to boil it down, the point was like when you're being a light, people, people see it Way before faster. they hear it. So they're always, look, they're, whether you want to believe it or not, or whether they believe it or not, or whether they know it or not, uh-huh. people are looking for your fruit before Actions they're going to open the door. Words. So like, and I tell, yeah. I tell Jason this all the time, like with him at work, with him being a, a newer Christian, yeah, definitely. it's like, like, yeah, man, I, you know, you, you want to reach the guys at work. I want you to reach the guys at work. A lot of times the door doesn't just immediately open like that when you're like, Hey man, I just met Jesus. Come to church. Like that's usually, you know, yeah, sometimes the door will open. Sometimes it won't. A lot of times they're going to look for your fruit. They're going to, they're going to tease you about it. They're going to mock you about they're it to see if you, you to stick fail with it. Too. Exactly. They're waiting for you. They're going to wait for you to you? fail yeah. or stumble like that. They're waiting to see how serious you are. Do you, you know, like how long is this going to last? And in some people, Man, in the wrong circle of friends, they're probably taking bets on, you know, oh, hey, this, let's see, yeah. wait till next year. Next year, he's going to be right back doing the same stuff. It's like, man, that's the whole thing. Like, live, <laughs> First Peter, was it 2.12? Mm-hmm. Live uh, the, the life among the pagans. Right. So that, man, somebody should make that into a shirt. Oh, man, or a hoodie or something? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. But uh, just live such a life that though they accuse you of doing wrong, like, they can't, 
they can't deny your deeds. They can't yeah. they can't deny your light. So that's the point is you you be that light and people will see you before they before they want to hear anything you have to say about Jesus. Most of the time mm-hmm. they want to see how you're living first. Right. Well that's where the and the world's version, the world's version of everything say, which is another fascinating topic we can get into is how much the world has sayings that are actually biblical scripture yeah. and biblical prefaces of actions speak louder than words. Yeah, of course, action speak. The light is the fastest. Yep. You, you see the light. And I forget what it was. I did something on it, like a little home Bible study a long time ago. But it was basically about that. We Everybody has two ministries, and it's an audio ministry and a visual ministry. What you say is your ministry, what comes out of your mouth, and what your tongue confesses, and then the visual ministry of what you do and how people get to watch you walk out your faith. Yeah. And if those two don't line up, if there's a disconnect... People will not. Yep. They will they not follow. They will, with it. they will write Jesus off everything. because of your disconnect. Exactly. You, and, and there's a. I forget which one it was, but I think it was Jesus, like on the boat. I forget what it was, but he had he had done some miracle, or he he was talking, and everyone's like, "Oh wow, that's amazing!" Or done some miracle, but he still needed to do like an action for people before they like. Yeah. Believed. I'd have to find it again. It was a very same thing. You read it, and you're kind of like, "Oh." They were, they believed, but they were still waiting for that. Like, I need to see it connect. Yeah. Um, what what they're saying and what they're doing needs to connect. Otherwise, that's what I'm not buying gotta, it. <laughs> Got to watch for the fruit, and that's that's. I mean, that's uh, like he. I mean, he condemned it where they, you know, they were looking for a sign. They always wanted mm-hmm. a sign. I think that's maybe that's what you're talking about. Where well, he was talking to the Pharisees on that part, where he was saying that, you know. Yeah. They're looking yeah. for a sign, but the only sign that's going to come is the sign no, of Jonah. It yeah, it wasn't that. I'd have to find it again. That's what I was thinking. I'll probably dig for it tonight and then send you a text at like 2 in the morning. <laughs> send it at 4. I'll be awake. Okay. Um, man. Cold dinners for both of us. Right. No, it better not be. Kelsey was making oxtail. Oh, so good. Well, all right. My battery's uh, at 12, so I don't want to let it die. Um, I think that's a good a good spot. I think, I think so. it's a good spot. We think, could go forever. Next time I think I'm it's just good. Bring I'm just reading plug. some of the comments. Kelsey said we can have a whole veggie garden. For where? Oh, like in here. Oh the yeah. Seeds because she she <clears throat> said I could preach and then Amanda could preach and then you could preach. She always leaves herself out. To, <laughs> she's, like she's not going to have. She's a doing ministry. wonderful with handling <laughs> everything else on the back end. She is. She's doing a lot. She does an insane amount. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. No. I, none of this would happen without without her beside me. Uh, so with that, Sunday morning, 10 a.m. and continue to come early. I will say, this last Sunday, I have never seen the amount of people in here that early. that early. That was like nice. I was shocked. That was nice. It was. I'm like, man, about time. Because. Yeah. <laughs> I got done trimming your beard and walked out. I was like, "Oh man, did we take <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Like, yeah. I don't understand the church culture, and I don't know if it's not everywhere. It's not everywhere. I don't know what it is, but show where we for show a up late game to tailgate, we'll do that. We show up early for work. We <laughs> show up, you know, we want to get that promotion at work, so we'll show up early and stay late. But man, church, I'm not coming in till the second or third song. And it has the most to give you. And then, the most and then leaving during the invitation. <laughs> Man, no, you need to stay for that whole thing. Come early Sunday morning. We start at 10, come 9.45, get a good seat. It's packing, so y'all, the, I'm telling you, the people that want to come later, you're going to get to the point where you're going to be standing up. Real quick, one word of encouragement for you. I thought about this the other day because I, I was in acting and drama when I was growing up, and they taught us about, like in Shakespeare's day, some of the old things like break a leg and some of those things and downstage and upstage. And I guess what we were told at the time was break a leg came from them telling them to do such a good job that they get hurt, but they would get hurt by the audience members in the front. I forget what they were called. They call them, I think, like the droolers or something. But if the performance was good enough, it was typically the lower class individuals that couldn't afford like the balcony seats and they were slower of mind or whatever. And they would sit up front. And if the performance was good enough, they would watch the show like with their mouth open just, and they would drool everywhere and it would get <laughs> slippery and you could fall and break your leg and fall off stage and have those issues. I didn't so, know that at all. But I would say as a rule of encouragement, because I know sometimes you're preaching and people, there's people like, Woo! Amen. Let's go. And then there's people like me who I'll do that sometimes, but other times I'm so like 
Right? <laughs> just watching, like Tanya I'm just, said that, I'm like literally just taking it all in. That like, it's Ugh. it's not a I'm not getting it, or that they're not getting it. Sometimes it's sometimes that I don't want to say performance because that's such a misleading term. Like what you're up here doing is acting, and it's not. Um, but the the words that are coming out of your mouth from the Bible and the scripture that's being illuminated yeah. to some people for the first time can be so overwhelming that they're literally just watching you and listening and waiting to be spoon fed more just. Yeah. She so said I, encouragement there I that if sometimes that happens and they're not all screaming that yeah. it's not that you're boring them. Sometimes they're so just she en said, uh, entranced with the word that's being spoken that. The, yeah. She yeah. said some of the, some of the stuff, it's just, it's so I, I hate to talk about myself, but just to repeat what was said to me, she just said uh, some of the stuff is so it's just so profound yep. that you're just kind of like, uh, and you got to like process it. And but you, it's which I get. But when you're in the moment and you say something that you think is profound or something, and then like, and it's like, weird too. I, I swear, sometimes God just stops my ears up here, which I'm fine. I'm, it's not about me, and I'm not looking for that. I enjoy the dialogue to make right. sure. I don't know. To me, it's like a dance with the congregation. Well, that's where a lot of the amen used to like. Amen yeah. was a way for the congregation to tell whoever was preaching or prophesying that what they were saying was truth in the Bible. They would be reading along or reading yeah. the scriptures or reading whatever the, the scrolls it, that they had. And so when they would say something, they would find it and then say, amen, meaning it's true. Yeah. What you're saying is true. It's in there. And it was a kind of a call response of, okay, you're getting confirmation that other people that might not have it are knowing, okay, he's not lying. Other people yeah. are confirming by saying amen. You're getting confirmation that the truth is being preached to you. Yeah, it's... It's weird because it's not it's not a, about that obviously, no. but in something I had said is it's 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 weird when you say something that you're like man this like to me it is because also this is a huge you say thing. it yeah. and even to me I'm like wow that was like it's that's, not that's my deep. it's yeah. coming from the Holy Spirit and you're like whoa. But then at the same time, it's like you say it and you're like, whoa. And then there's like nothing just, and you're like, oh man, like was that was that. Wrong. My ego, right? Like if, if it creates this huge thing where you're like, Guess did they track. not get it? Do I need to dig in more on this? You know, was it was that something that I came up with? Or, you know, I thought that was the Holy Spirit. Was that me? Like, oh, and you just like it's it just it spirals the enemy. I mean, it, it taxi you up here, and it's just like whoa. And then um, the the other side of that coin for just the family room and, and the back end of it when you're preaching. And again, like, not that it's all about the response, but when it's like dead silent, it is the most lonely feeling in the, like, give me something. Yeah. You're like, just, just say something. So I, I feel like you're listening, even though it's not about me, but right. it's just like, you know, you're up here, you're pouring your heart out and you know, the, you feel like the Holy Spirit's speaking through you and everything. And then when it's just dead quiet, you're like. Oh man, like I am, I am so, it's me and God and I am so alone <laughs> and it's just the weirdest thing. And then you come up with people after church like, man, that was awesome. Did you hear all these people yelling? Like, I didn't, I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Like I swear sometimes you just, God doesn't let me hear it, which yeah, is exactly. fine. Uh, Cause again, like, and I've had to like, you know, I've preached stuff and I'm, I come down off the stage. It's only happened like a couple times <laughs> where, uh, <laughs> My wife, where you, I, I've had one where I came down and like as soon as I, I said the prayer or whatever altar call and I said amen and I just like booked it through the door to like go get some water, but I like as soon as I walked out I was like that was the worst like I just wanted to hide I was like it was the worst thing I did such a terrible job like I just dropped the ball so bad blah 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 like just enemy immediately fighting me and just that downward spiral <laughs> and then. Um, Jared Furtick. <laughs> uh, that downward spiral, and then you come out afterwards after church, and you get this just outpouring of people that are like bawling their eyes out. Like, that was, I needed that. I needed this. I needed, like, that was the most amazing. And it was like, you see, obviously, okay, it's not, mm -hmm. obviously, it's not about me. It's about right. God and then him speaking to them. So it's it's weird. It's it's a weird thing. The whole thing is weird. And then especially now with AI, like it's the weirdest time to be a pastor and, and speaking to people. But man, I, I, I don't want to do anything else. I know this is my call. I've never 
it's weird. It's weird, man. You, you feel so fulfilled while simultaneously feeling the most insecure and depressed. I don't envy you. Entire so. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Like uh, it's it's fulfilling, and then for me, uh, so for you, and then everyone watching, you want to pray for your pastor. Uh, I'll tell you right now, it's like pretty much clockwork every week now. Friday, I'm, Saturday. It's, yeah, Friday, Saturday. My week starts out like this, and then it, it kind of goes off and it goes down, and Friday and Saturday are when the enemy hits me the most. Every week, same thing. And now it's like, I expect it, and it's whatever, but it gets to that point where you just, it's, you know, it's like sticks and stones don't hurt me, whatever, words don't hurt me, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you get tired of hearing it, and that's what wears you down. Yeah. You're like, I, I know none of this is true, I know none of this is true. Like, I know God's going to meet me on the platform. It's going to be great no matter what, blah, 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 like all of that. But it's like, I'm so tired of hearing this same thing. But he's not going to stop. I mean, that's, mm. he's the father of lies, so he's just going to keep going and going and going. But it's like, man, you don't understand. I'm not going to quit. So you keep that's saying we, this. That's why we have to have scripture in our hearts so ignoring can combat that. it. It is written. Yeah. You know? It is written. It, otherwise, that earworm, like the sheep, got to anoint ourselves and seal ourselves. Otherwise, he gets in there. So... I think you're doing a great job. And, uh, yeah. That's great. So, yes, yeah, Sunday, uh, come early. I don't know who that is. Come early and, uh, yeah, 10 a.m. And uh, we will see you Sunday morning. If not, we'll see you here, I'm sure, next week. And then Sunday after that. I'm excited. But thank you, guys. We love you. Have a great rest of the week. This is not Jason. This is Mitch. Mitch. Uh, that's my fault for, for you know, not updating the computer. But, uh, yeah, so we love you guys. We'll see you next week. Have a beautiful rest of the week. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.